It's time for Operation Freedom with your host, Dr. Dave Janda, on Southeast Michigan's conservative powerhouse, Wham Talk 1600. Thanks for tuning in, folks, and welcome back to Wham Talk 1600's Operating Theater. It's the only OR in all of talk radio. I'm Dr. Dave Janda, broadcasting live, live from Wham Talk 1600's Freedom Bunker, and we're hidden deep inside the People's Republic of Ann Arbor. We're here every Sunday from 3 to 5 Eastern. Now, with the brilliance and help of Derek and Matt Clark, we have this show available for you every Monday morning in podcast form. And all you have to do is go to DaveJanda.com. You can download the entire show or portions of the show, but I think you'll want every aspect of today's show to download and get it to your friends and families, your neighbors, anyone you care about, because the information you hear here, you're not going to get on the mainstream media. Every week in our operating room, we dissect current events that are impacting you, your family, your business, our community, and our country. And we bring to our operating room information and guests, and today is no different. The mainstream media either ignores because it doesn't fit into their politically conceived, uh, preconceived correct agenda, or because they're afraid, yeah, afraid of what might happen if they actually tell you what you need to know. This show is about your political, your economic, your financial, and your health care freedom. I am very, very happy to have back with us Vince Wade. Vince is one of the most outstanding investigative journalists in the country. He's a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. He worked at several Oklahoma City radio stations, then moved to Keener, very famous radio station in their Detroit, uh, Windsor area. And then he went to, cha- uh, to Channel 7, WXYZ, switched to TV news at that point in his career, then switched to Channel 7 between 1972 and 1989, then moved to Channel 2 in 1989. And from 1989 to 1990, Six, uh, he worked at Channel Two. He decided then to leave the TV news business and become a freelance writer and multimedia producer, who has won many awards, twenty in fact, with his work in radio and TV, including three Emmys and a first place award for best local TV news documentary at the New York and San Francisco film festivals. He is the founder of Wade Multimedia. Vince, welcome back to Operation Freedom. Good to be back with you. So, Vince, you have been one, if not the only, investigative journalist in our country investigating the relationship between China, our government, and large industries within our government. So my question for you, Vince, is did we bail out General Motors with our hard-earned tax dollars so it could survive to become a Chinese company? Dave, that's my belief. Um, It has... uh become increasingly apparent in small increments, or maybe not so small increments really, over a period of time that General Motors basically has the United States of America in its rearview mirror as a marketplace. Mm -hmm. Uh, It sees uh, emerging markets as its future and viability. And this makes some skewed sense, I suppose, because General Motors... Uh, through a series of bad decisions and uh, cars being uh, essentially dictated by bean counters as opposed to what the the auto industry calls car guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, A a series of bean counters uh, ran General Motors into the ground. They've been, they have steadily lost market share Mm -hmm. uh, since, uh, oh golly, uh, the 70s, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, they basically decided that they were going to become a, a corporation, I believe. They, they're going to become a corporation uh, in China as opposed to the United States of America. They will keep uh, a headquarters uh, in the United States uh, down at the Ren- Renaissance Center mm-hmm. in Detroit mm-hmm. um, merely for cosmetic purposes. But essentially, uh, I think the evidence shows, and we're going to discuss that today on your show, the evidence shows that uh, General Motors is essentially becoming a Chinese corporation. And, you know, Vince, many people that might hear that, um, including folks that work for General Motors, say, well, that's kind of over the top. But in fact, it is actually not over the top um, because you've uncovered some evidence right out of the horse's own mouth. Dan Ackerson, the CEO of General Motors, recently gave a speech to Chinese and Asian beat reporters in Shanghai. And you've uncovered these clips. And let's, let's hit the first clip, Derek, that uh, Vince has sent us. 
We have 11 joint ventures in China with SAIC and FAW. We're involved in vehicle manufacturing, sales, distribution, engineering, design, downstream businesses such as telematics, financing, and used cars. We operate 11 assembly plants in China, four powertrain plants in eight cities across the country. We have more than 2,700 dealerships and sales outlets nationwide. Now, that was Dan Ackerson, the CEO of General Motors, correct, Vince? That is correct. He made uh, this uh, presentation to reporters in uh, Shanghai, China, mm -hmm. in February of 2011. And uh, I, f I found a copy of it. Uh, you know, the, the Internet's a wonderful thing. It's, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's out there. And you have to dig around for this kind of thing. But, but I found it. But the, the interesting thing uh, about this is that it got some, quote unquote, some media coverage in the United States. But if you listen to the totality of what uh, Ackerson said, it's amazing. It's mm -hmm. absolutely amazing what mm -hmm. he's very candid. Mm -hmm. He he's not pulling any uh, sly ones here. Uh, he's very candid about uh, the future of General Motors, and he believes. Uh, in, and you, if you listen to this speech, he believes the future of General Motors is in China, not the United States of America. I, I, and I'd like to uh, point out to a, a particular segment of what we just heard mm -hmm. that uh, that I want to go back and revisit in just a moment. L l I want to. Uh, uh, have have our audience pay attention to the very first thing he said in that soundbite. So if we can play that one uh, piece back here, I think I, I want to talk about that a little bit. Okay, Derek, hit clip two for us, please. We have 11 joint ventures in China with SAIC and FAW. So, Vince, what are SAIC and FAW, and why are they significant? Those are Chinese automobile companies. They're part of... Uh, we used to call it the big three here in, in uh, the United States. They call it the big four over there. Mm -hmm. SAIC and FAW are both owned by the communist government of China. Mm -hmm. They are not private corporations. It's not like um, General Motors uh, decided to do a joint venture with, say, uh, TRW or Borg Warner or mm -hmm. somebody like that. They're, ho uh, they're wholly yeah. owned companies by the Chinese communist government. That's right. The Chinese Communist government, uh, and a lot of people I believe in, in America don't really understand the, the way business works in China. Mm -hmm. uh, the really important industries are controlled or outright owned by the Communist Chinese government because of the fact that it's an authoritarian regime. Uh, you know, their private enterprise is uh, whatever the Communist Party of China says it is. Mm -hmm. And, and so SAIC and FAW are two state-owned, and, and we've got to talk about this term state-owned, because what it really means is it's owned by the, by the communist government of China. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, these are two state-owned major automobile manufacturers in China. So what, what we're talking about here is that General Motors Corporation has 11 joint ventures with the communist Chinese government. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. Right. And, and, and so I, I wanted to emphasize that particular point to our audience because I think that um, Americans don't really grasp what we're talking about when you hear the bland term, uh, they've done a deal with so-and-so, um, uh, you know, SAIC, a state-owned company. So it's, it's it's not private enterprise. It's not free trade. No, this is this, this is there's nothing free about about communism. No, it's all authoritarian trade, really. If you come yeah, down to it. Right. exactly, and, and exactly. That, and so and so General Motors hasn't done just like a deal with a toe in the water. No, with uh, the Chinese communist government, they've mm -hmm. done a, by Ackerson's uh, own statement, they've uh, done eleven joint ventures with the communist Chinese government. And and and, uh, and and it looks to be expanding, and which we'll talk about in a minute. Well, and it goes beyond that, it, it, it be, right, Vince? Because it even focuses on the R and D aspects that that Ackerson has been moving to China, and we have a clip as it relates to that. Derek, hit clip three. We're now building out 
the Advanced Technology Center, which will bring our research and development uh, that is centered largely in the United States. We're going to diversify that more into China because we think this market is so critically important to the success of our company. I mean, Vince, I did a lot of work at the GM Tech Center in Warren when I, when I was doing research in prevention and impact issues. Uh, that was their hub of their research uh, for, for what went into their cars. But also, you know, I, I ran into a lot of folks from our government there that were doing Defense Department work as well in the Tech Center. That's now going to China, according to Ackerson? That's exactly what he said. I mean, to, to repeat, uh, without playing the clip again, uh, to repeat what he said, uh, he says that we're going to bring our research and development that is centered largely in the United States. We're going to diversify that more into China because we think this market is so critically important to the success of our company. Now, for people who might have taken offense at our initial contention that General Motors is becoming China Motors, mm -hmm. listen, to, just just think about what, what Ackerson said. The, the very heart and soul of building automobiles is the research and development. It's, it's the design center. It's designing the cars. It's coming up with what the customer wants. Well, here we've got the, ch the uh, chairman of General Motors mm -hmm. telling us in plain English mm -hmm. with, with, with no sh beating around the bush right. that they are going to move the focus of General Motors research and development, the fabled tech center, uh, that, that gave us, uh, you, you know, the, the, the Corvettes and the, and, and the, uh, GTOs and all that kind of stuff. Um, that that's all moving to China now. And so I, I'm not sure what's going to happen to the GM tech center. Apparently a lot less. Um, it, it's just going to be, uh, it's just going to be sort of a, a shell of what it used to be because all of that work is going to China. Again, by the uh, by, the statements that were made by the, the chairman of General Motors. And it goes beyond moving facilities to China. In fact, Ackerson has talked about GM being fully committed to China, and I think that's exemplified in the last clip that you sent us. Derek, clip four, please. GM remains fully committed to this market for the long term by pulling the necessary resources and investments together to be a more effective competitor, firstly in China and then on a more global basis. Firstly in China. This is yep. the, the CEO of General Motors who the taxpayers bailed out. That's right. To the tune of $80 billion with a B, $80 billion of our tax money went to bail out General Motors to, to keep it on life support so it could come back to life and move to China in, in everything but name and headquarters only. You know, you know, I think that, I think that this is appalling and, and I think it ought to be part of the uh, political campaign. Mm -hmm. and, and let's just talk about that briefly for a minute. Uh, if we can, uh, Mitt Romney has uh, criticized uh, the, the automo uh, automotive bailout as crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the uh, claim for that uh, term, crony capitalism, has to do with the fact that the unions, the UAW in particular, uh, which is a big supporter of Barack Obama, uh, made out okay in the bankruptcy. Uh, mm -hmm. A whole lot of creditors got shafted, but uh, the UAW was taken care of mm -hmm. uh, by the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, Mitt Romney is calling it crony capitalism. Well, they're, they're we can debate whether or not that that's legitimate, but I mean, at least, you know, he's got a basis for what he's saying. But the other side of this is uh, that uh, Mitt Romney shouldn't throw stones in glass houses. And why I say that is, is that two of his biggest campaign contributors, um, John Paulson and um, uh, this fellow named Singer, mm -hmm. uh, they, they made over a billion dollars off of the, uh, the bailout. Uh, operation. They're mm -hmm. hedge fund managers in, in on Wall Street, right? And and uh, um, they basically cashed in. They made a three thousand percent profit off of the Obama bailout. Boy, that's so, almost as good as so, Hillary so Clinton. So Mitt Romney's uh, <laughs> primary financial backers in his campaign made out like bandits, if mm -hmm. you'll pardon the term, mm -hmm. they uh, are. On, on the Obama bailout. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm what I'm saying to the to the audience is. 
you know, we've been shafted by both parties and, mm-hmm. and they need to understand that. And we need to start demanding a, a, a debate about this stuff. What really happened here? What's really going on here? Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, a reasonable question for Barack Obama is why uh, did you let this happen? Mm-hmm. Why did you let uh, General Motors slip away and basically shift its focus to China when we're bailing it out with our tax dollars? Uh, it's outrageous. And a reasonable question for the Republicans is why are you letting this happen with this GMification with China, with China essentially taking over uh, a taxpayer bailout organization? You know, Vince, I believe this is an incredibly important information for every American to know about, and they need to network it with every person they know because it's Americans that saved General Motors that's now developed this relationship with China. You know, Vince, let's turn to something else because there's another issue going on here with borders. And our governor, who, as you well know, I'm not a big fan of, uh, is in the process of trying to destroy a family, a private enterprise that owns the Ambassador Bridge, which is the safest and most efficient border crossing in the world, and he's trying to build a separate bridge at huge taxpayer expense. Is that entire bridge issue another part of this Chinification of GM issue? I believe it is. And wha- I believe that uh, Why do you while, believe it's that? Not, while it's not directly uh, 100% tied in, it, it's, it's part of the larger mosaic of uh, a bunch of greedy people uh, and Democrats and Republicans who are basically uh, cashing in in the short term on allowing the communist government of China to take over our economy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and Rick Snyder is, is, is one of them. But Barack Obama, by letting General Motors uh, do these deals uh, with China while it was under federal government uh, control, uh, is equally culpable. Mm-hmm. So that, I, I make the point to our audience, and I know lots of people love to – to think uh, that it's all one way or the other, that it's, you know, that uh, the Democrats are, are, are the enemy or the Republicans are the enemy. I disagree. I think they're both the enemy of, of the American taxpayer right now. And we need to start demanding straight answers from all of these people and, and, and not listening to their uh, propaganda. We, we need to get past this so-called spin stuff. But let's talk, let's talk about this bridge thing. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the bridge is part of uh, – a major initiative by the federal government of Canada to essentially uh, divert China's exports to the United States from the ports of Los Angeles and, and Long Beach mm-hmm. out here in California mm-hmm. and, and move them through uh, uh, the Pacific Northwest, through mm-hmm. Vancouver and through uh, Prince uh, Rupert Island, which is just north of there. Mm-hmm. They essentially want to become the gateway. Canada does, Mm -hmm. wants to become the gateway to North America for Chinese exports. Mm -hmm. And the the bridge figures prominently into their whole effort to control the the, uh, exports moving into the United States uh, from abroad. Mm -hmm. And then they're they're trying to do it on both the Atlantic and the Pacific side. And and the bridge is one of their key nodes in all of this. Um, You know, the the Canadian government is, is behind uh, they're, they're pulling strings on on uh, Rick Snyder like he's a puppet, mm-hmm. and 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 we have to at least take a look at some of the arguments, which you haven't seen in the, in the in the mainstream media in Michigan because they're all lapdogs to the power establishment. They're scared to death that they're going to lose revenue if they don't kowtow to what uh, Rick Snyder and and the uh, economic powers behind him. Want. Yeah, the press and is worried about their ad revenue. Therefore, they're not trying to protect the American public and at least uh, educate the American public on this issue. Well, well, that's right. That's right. Uh, let me see here. I've got um, uh, a, uh, a a study that was done for the bridge company, for Matty Maroon's company, by an outfit called Conway McKenzie. Mm-hmm. The Conway McKenzie uh, study of the of the revenue mm-hmm. based, based on their analysis of traffic across the bri- the, the, the supposed new bridge, mm-hmm. they, they say that uh, they project that it's going to lose $1.5 billion from 2016 through 2035. And so the whole argument that uh, the, the bridge is not going to cost the taxpayer a dime Bull. Uh, is, is predicated mm-hmm. on the notion that uh, the, the tolls are going to pay for it. Now let's, now let's 
stipulate here that Conway McKenzie is working for the Maroon Company. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this let, let's just say that this is a biased report. But if there's if it's even close to the truth, cut it in half. It's still a huge whack to the Michigan taxpayer. Don't, right? Don't the taxpayers of Michigan deserve to have a more thorough examination of this? They sure do. Uh, you know why? Why is everybody uh, so determined to sweep every, all these objections under the rug? You know, I pointed out in a, in a YouTube video, Dave, that uh, that the, that the bridge, the uh, this new bridge, is all part of the the so-called NAFTA superhighway that that so many people are upset about because of uh, national sovereignty. Mm-hmm. That hasn't been discussed, mm-hmm. and and it needs to be discussed. And the the the, the um, taxpayers of Michigan need to understand that they're being lied to. One of the lies, and I'm and I'm saying this just outright. Rick Snyder has lied about the, it's not going to cost the taxpayers a dime, Be, but yet he turns right around and says, well, we're going to have federal money come in here and help us uh, do this and do that. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Federal money is tax money. Right. Tax money comes from the taxpayers. Mm-hmm. So it's already going to cost the Michigan taxpayers lots of dimes. The mm-hmm. other side of this too is, is that, and the, these are just things that we need to, to look at. I'm, I'm, I'm not here trying to defend Matty Maroon. I'm trying to look out for the for the taxpayer right here. and that's what we and, do and, here and so exactly and so you know matty maroon can fend for himself i mean he, he he's a big boy and he's got uh, deep pockets but uh, but i'm talking about what what's on the hook for the taxpayer here mm-hmm. uh, the, the mackinac bridge is a good example the mackinac bridge uh w- was built with a promise that it wasn't going to t- cost the taxpayers anything right, well guess right. what yeah guess uh, what? about 15 years after the mackinac bridge was built uh, there was concerns that the tolls were too high <laughs> um uh, and it was uh, Im- impacting um, economic development in the Upper Peninsula. Mm-hmm. So the legislature turned right around and, go, and said, "Oops, well, maybe we should uh, divert some tax revenue to, to offset the operations of the Mackinac Bridge after all." Mm-hmm. So this business that it's not going to cost the taxpayers a dime, you know, says who? And and what is it that you're going to do that uh, can guarantee that sometime in the future uh, we will never have? Uh, a, a situation where the, the the new Detroit bridge is too big to fail, so therefore we've got to go to the legislature and ask for tax revenue. You know, there's there's nothing uh, to support that, and and there's there's a whole lot of this that just hasn't been explored and and debated in in the public. And we need to have the debate. You know, we we need to take a look at at, at Matty Maroon's argument. But here's the here's the other thing is that Maroon is is offering to build a, a bridge by himself. Yeah, with no and, taxpayer expense, none, well, zero no taxpayer expense, zero. You know? Yeah, he, it's it's going to be it's going to be a business proposition for him. Why are they so adamant about uh, about not looking at that? The other side of this is is that you know we've already spent uh, millions of dollars mm-hmm. to uh, to upgrade the customs uh, operation at the current Ambassador Bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know the the, the I seventy five was shut down for uh, several years while they while they redid all of that. Right, and 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 now we're going to build one of those plazas again. Why? You well, know what? What? There's the the traffic studies don't support that contention, and so uh, I, I think that this whole thing is just part of the. And I believe what uh, to, to cut to the chase here, Dave. I, I think what's going to happen is General Motors wants to create what what amount to car kits, where they they take their big operation in China, mm-hmm. they put all the elements together, and they ship them to Canada. They then have uh, the Canadian auto workers do the final assembly of mm-hmm. Chinese cars, uh, GM cars made in China, mm-hmm. and then ship them across the border under the cover of NAFTA in terms of tax uh, uh, treatment. Right, and and so I, I I think that's what this whole bridge thing is partly about. It's it's more than just that, but that that is a key component to it. So that's how that's how the whole Chinification of General Motors becoming China Motors. I believe, fits into the bridge issue. And Canada wins big because according to Article 8, as I've researched, in the U.S.-Canada Tax Treaty, it is that Canadian trains and and trucks, listen to this, folks, pay no U.S. federal and state income or gross receipt taxes on their profits from bringing freight in and out of the United States. So China wants that because guess what? Their cost of business goes down because they're not having to pay the taxes as if they want them brought them in through these other ports. You know, Vince, I'd like to thank you for all your hard efforts on this. How can folks follow your work? Well, I, I've, I've posted some YouTube videos on this stuff. Um, and and uh, basically, you look up uh, the Detroit Bridge, uh, you can see that. I'm going to be putting together... Uh, a, a new YouTube video very soon on uh, General Motors becoming China Motors. 
and, and so you can basically uh, follow my stuff on YouTube. That's where I've been posting this stuff. And um, if you want to find out more about the bridge, look at look at Rick Snyder's uh, NAFTA bridge. That's one of the YouTube videos. Um, and, and also whether China is going to be actually uh, building uh, a part of this new bridge if it comes to pass. Folks, you're listening to Operation Freedom. We're here on Wham Talk 1600 every Sunday from three to five.